We're here on Duke's campus with the president of Duke University, Dr. Nan Cohan, and with the incoming president of Duke University, Dean Richard Broadhead of Yale uh, College. We are all thrilled that you're here. You come with rave reviews, but how does anybody come behind and fill the shoes of Nan Cohan? Oh, that's a pretty tough question. My thought about that is she's left this school in great, great shape. Nan and I didn't know each other well before, but I think that we have found each other to uh, get along extremely well, see things very similarly, and so I think that the transition will be a very, very smooth one. And I've already Absolutely. discovered that there's a Yale connection in Nan's past because you got your PhD at Yale. And so there's just tons and tons of connections, and, it seems to me. And you know that the fact that the blue is the same is not accidental. <laughs> we actually picked <laughs> up Duke blue from well, Yale blue. Yale, Yale picked up its blue from Oxford, so, <laughs> so uh, there you it, go. it's a great what color, so, why not? That, so right? why not? And Dick, as you approach Duke, yeah. Uh, and from a cosmic sense, in, in a way, what are you most what are you most excited about, sort of getting your hands on? Oh well, let's think about that. The answer is a ton. Learning my way through all the parts of the university. The thing I continually find most surprising when I come here is the degree of uh, cooperation, enthusiastic cooperation across the schools and among the different parts of, of Duke. This is very, very rare uh, to see such a thing. And so just to come and be a part of that, uh, to help support all the ventures that are taking place that way, that'll, that'll be uh, a great, great thing. And of course, I'll always have a great deal of my heart in the world of undergraduates and making sure they have uh, the most stimulating intellectual experience and the most stimulating and en enriching social experience while they're here too. You both will have come here from mm -hmm. uh, a, a college and it, to a large research university. What was it about this place, Nan? What was it about Duke? I was intrigued by this, this place as a wonderful combination of restlessness and um, being laid back. It seemed like a place <laughs> a great way that to put it. is both, both proud of its regional traditions and its roots here in the South and its roots in this, in this very special um, community, mm -hmm. but also very much determined to realize the founder's vision for a truly world-class university, to be one of the leading educational institutions in the world and I somehow to do right. both at once. Exactly I found right. that quite intriguing. It seemed to me, well, you know, you're one or the other, but how can you be both? So what was it about this place that was... Uh, it's a well-known fact. I wasn't looking for a job. There was nothing... I had no unhappiness in the position I was in. Uh, and, uh, and so it really would have taken something pretty special. And when I first met with the committee, I was intrigued. But as soon as I started to meet with them, you just felt something, a kind of dynamism about this place. It's possible to have ambitions and then to advance toward them very quickly. This is, this is really, in my experience, quite rare in universities. There's just a, a degree of straightforwardness, friendliness, warmth, uh, that, that it's a very appealing. I, I wouldn't be interested to go to a university that was defined only by its friendliness. But you, go there, more, you go there for right. its intellectual edge and dynamism. So right. much has been said and written right. in recent years about wonderful colleges and universities that right. didn't give the faculty attention to the undergraduate. How do you make sure that is there and remains there? I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we face. And frankly, I think it's one of the things that Dick inherits that I know he will have the opportunity to, um, to clarify and even improve. We've worked... We worked hard to remind faculty members that even as we become a more prestigious and more demanding research environment, we also have to be sure that we provide the kind of nurturing education that undergraduates need and deserve and come rightly to expect. You're never going to choose people for faculty positions in a great research university who aren't themselves really pushing, uh, opening the horizons of new knowledge. It's, they have to be that, or else they're not making the kind of contribution that makes this the kind of university it wants to be. But within the very small set of those people, you still have your choice of whether to pay attention to other traits or not. And there are plenty of schools in this country that have a brilliant research faculty because they pay no attention to the person's te teacherly qualities when they hire them. Uh, and it does seem to me that the university that's going to give a great education to undergraduates is going to be one that gives all the attention on the research side that the best research university does, but also remembers to put a big weight in the scale on the part of undergraduate teaching. Uh, broadly construed, you know, 
when all of us go into our life as faculty members, we enter narrow little boxes. The world of the academy is the world of narrow specializations. You know, an undergraduate education can be such a pleasure for faculty members because it enables them to escape the world of specialization into the world of people who are curious about everything. Uh, that's the reward. You can't solve these problems by telling people it's their duty to do things, uh, but rather by exposing them to the endless spirit and curiosity and pleasure that's to be found in undergraduate teaching. But is there any advice that you would you would presume to give Dick about oh, I'm dying to what's it. going on? <laughs> In terms of, you know, you have the undergraduate, but then you have all these graduate schools here. You've got the medical center, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Huge. Um, mm -hmm. I think that um, this is this will be a much longer conversation between Dick and me sure. than we can have in one brief afternoon. But some of the things that I will certainly want to talk with Dick about have to do with the specific characteristics of each of the schools. How, what it means to educate young people for the pastorate and what it means to educate engineers and what they need to have right. made available to them and what the, the problems are going to be in doing that are different. And I, yeah. I think it's important to remind ourselves of that. Any particular thoughts about student life at Duke as you Student come? life? Oh, you know, the thing you have to remember about me is I've only been associated with Duke a pretty short time. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not going to start offering opinions I'm about not a million things. <laughs> I, would say, I would say one thing, uh, something I care very deeply about is when students come to college, we have to uh, understand and accept and celebrate that they ought to be able to f be free to associate themselves just as they like with the people they like and all of those things. Uh, but it's very important in a college for people to understand that there is a community in the college as well uh, and to be willing to meet the different people, to learn from the different people, to learn the, uh, the good things you can do uh, with people the likes of whom you've never met before. Uh, this, is, this is a challenge for all colleges and I think, I think it's something that Duke has some progress to make in, as every school does. And what do, what do you see are the challenges for Dick as he comes in? Well, there are plenty left. <laughs> We've done a lot, but there's still a lot more to do. We've concentrated on a number of areas, and I think we've perhaps done best in the area we tackled first, which was um, physical recreation. And now we have the Wilson Recreation Facility, the Brody Gym. We have opportunities for students to work out, to have places where they can convene, etc. We've done a I think a very good job in many ways on residential life. The freshman East Campus has generally been regarded as a great success, even though it's very controversial. Most people feel that it's worked very well. The, the, the future of Central Campus could be a big part of this picture. And then finally, well, in terms of extracurricular life and community service, I think we've done mm -hmm. a really good job. Duke students are, are strong in all those areas, and they have so many things to do that my only concern is that they don't get enough sleep because they're doing all of them. To be a student in a place where none of the problems of the world are on display is not that good an education in my view. Uh, and uh, both Yale and Duke have a very strong tradition of service on the part of student community, service on the part of students. And I think that that's be it's partly because they're in places where there are those opportunities. And I'd like to think that the students who go forth from Duke as the ones I like to think who go forth from Yale are people who have learned in their college years lots of things in the classroom, but also lots of things about what it is to be a member of a community and the uh, possibilities and obligations one has to put one's gifts in the service of a community. As, as we know very well, the cost of attending uh, any one of the Absolutely. prestigious schools in this country has right. far outstripped inflation. Um, right. And for all the need-based assistance that goes on, some people are worrying out loud that it's not only pricing middle-income people, it's pricing upper middle-income people out of the best educations, if you will. Nan, first of all, what's the prospect for dealing with this? You mentioned along the way need-based aid, and we have to recognize that a lot of the people who receive financial aid now at a place like Duke or Yale have incomes of $150,000, $200,000. These are not just for people who are at the poverty line, and most people are not aware of that. And there is no investment that is more likely to bear fruit than giving your child a really good university education. All the data shows that. And, and we have to say we will make wise choices. We will try to keep our costs down. But we also have to recognize it's a very competitive universe. It's tough because uh, it, it, the cost of tuition at private universities has gone up higher than inflation. But you know why? If you buy a loaf of bread in 1984 and a loaf of bread in 2004, that's the same thing. And inflation is the change of the price for the same thing. When students come to a great university, they want there to be 
uh, absolute cutting edge lab facilities for kids to be able to have access uh, to early in their education. These things are immensely costly. Computers. Uh, the the uh, information technology mm -hmm. upgrades. Uh, so, so that's to say, if the university only kept itself the same through the years, no one would be interested in it. Uh, and so the trouble with universities is uh, both others and we ourselves want the university to get better and better in any of a thousand dimensions, all very costly. And yet you have to remember that you're thinking of av average families and how are they going to afford it. It is of the essence for universities of a certain sort, I think Duke is one of them, to remember that education is the great open door of social opportunity in this country. You know, the talented and smart people come from very well-to-do families in some cases, but they don't all come from, from su such families. And universities have got to be the door that open the way for students of intelligence who are willing to work hard to make what they can of themselves with their gifts. Uh, and that means that Deep Blind Aid is always going to be uh, an, an, an essential feature of this university as long as I'm associated with it. Uh, and then beyond that, it'll never be cheap. And then one has to remember, you're getting something of value. I want to ask you about athletics. My husband and I were at our high school junior son's first college night uh, just a few nights ago. And Yale's director of admissions was there to speak to the, to the parents of, of our son's school. And when he was asked about intercollegiate athletics, he mentioned that there were 35 different varsity right. uh, sports at, at Yale. Having said that, with all due respect, there's no Coach K, there's no Coach G. I noticed that. <laughs> so what about the transition from Yale and its spirited competition to the kind of, how do I say, really spirited <laughs> Let uh, me be frank. Let blue me be devil frank. fire that you find here at Duke? I have presided with perfect sincerity over an Ivy League athletics program. Uh, uh, but I will be able to preside with just the same sincerity and with very great enthusiasm over one of the level of Duke. Uh, you know, one, one of the first things that happened after I was announced as the new president was to go to Madison Square Garden for the Duke-Texas game the week before Christmas. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the level of play is magnificent. The level of spirit it brings forward, it just these are unforgettable. And then I went to the Duke Yukon game since I the women's game since I come from Connecticut of course uh, it wasn't surprising I was there but I was one of about six people in a, a crowd of 18,000 rooting for Duke uh, you know the women won in the last second of the game yeah. this was a thrill I'm going to love this I want to reinforce the importance of that answer because right. it's been most most exciting for me to watch Dick's serious interest in and excitement about Duke athletics. I'm told by his good friend and mine, Rick Levin, the president of Yale, that mm -hmm. after he met Coach Krzyzewski on his first right. visit here That's and right. a picture was taken of the two of them together, mm -hmm. he emailed it to President Levin, who is also a, a serious athlete, adm admirer of athletics in his own right, and said, Something like, eat your heart out. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, people say to me, oh, at Duke, they have such great basketball. People say to me, oh, at Duke, they have such great weather. And you want to know something? I'm not coming here for the basketball, and I'm not coming here for the weather. I'm coming here for all the things that make this a great school. But it's very deeply important sure. to everybody. Sure. So no particular advice to Dick. Uh, beyond, he, get, he, beyond, gets he gets it. it. He, he gets already, it. He already, finally, the campaign for Duke. Um, what is it, as you come here, are you familiar with campaigns for you bet. colleges and universities? You bet. You bet. What is it about a campaign that is important to the continuation of everything that's good about a place like Yale or Duke? I, I give this a lot of thought. Uh, first of all, imagine the pleasure of coming here at a time when the friends and alumni of this university have just given it better than $2 billion to do, to do good things with. Uh, a campaign is about people who've had the benefit of the university or people who admire what goes on there, giving the university the means to continue to do good things and to go on to do better things. Uh, but it's also, it, it seems to me it's something else. Uh, campaigns are about people giving money, but it's also about people reconnecting with universities and reinvesting in universities. And I do think the campaigns that we've had at Yale uh, have always had the effect that people understand the university better. They, they knew it when they were students, then they go on with their life. And it provides a time to bring people closer back in and to learn the new things that are going on. One of the most important contributions that this particular campaign has made to Duke is reflected in an answer that Dick gave earlier about the distinctive qualities of this university as a very collaborative place where people think in interdisciplinary terms with great ease across schools. The campaign helped to reinforce that sense of, quote, Big D, as we call it, 
And we, we owe a lot to both the development staff and the volunteers okay. for understanding how crucial that was. We were told at the beginning, if you have each school go off and do its own thing, mm. you will have much less success okay. than if every school recognizes that one of the main reasons people want to give to Duke whether it's the Fuqua School or the Medical School or the Law School or Arts and Sciences, is because it's part of Duke. And so if everyone together recognizes that, we will do a much better job. The deans and everyone else are more likely to think collaboratively, I think in part, because they've learned through this campaign that the results are very fruitful. I think another thing the campaign has done, to go back to Dick's point about reconnecting, is to bring alumni and parents closer to Duke from around the world, and I mean literally around the world. You know, there's nothing in the world like the American university of the sort that Duke is. There's nothing like it. You don't find these things in foreign countries, places where the highest level of medical research is done at a place that also has a fabulous athletics program, that also has an undergraduate school that tries to give a completely rounded education of mind, of body, of spirit. Uh, you know, the, 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 the aspirations of American universities of this sort are enormous. They're so complicated and so interwoven. Um, and these things can't be, they, they, they can just barely be done, but they can't be done without continual support. And when people step forward to give the kind of support that's been given here, it's a magnificent thing. People think of it maybe as a chore, and yet I, I've watched Nan over the years, and she does what I've seen her do of it. She does with joy and excitement. Right. I mean, does that just, it just comes with the job, and how do you stay up for it, I guess is my <laughs> Well, Question. it's true that presidents of universities today must be aware that one of the privileges and obligations of a job like this is to make the connection with some of the major potential donors to the university who expect and need to hear from the president when the final decisions are to be made. And I find it really quite heartening, and I know Dick is already aware of this, that the people that I meet with right. in making the case for Duke are fascinating people. They're really interesting people in their own right. I found that most of the time it really is a rewarding opportunity to hear from people who have reason to care deeply about this place, or if they don't, to see it as a challenge to persuade them to do so. And that's a fun enterprise, and you don't always succeed, you don't always get a yes, but you usually make people think in a new way about their university and show them why they should have pride in it. Any thoughts on that? Before? Well, I've done, a, I've done a good deal of development work in my uh, soon-to-be-past university. I'll do, <laughs> I'll do a good deal more in the, in the future. I, I do it uh, uh, with pleasure because if you believe in the university and you know it needs support to fulfill its ambitions, then to go out and get that support is a good thing. Uh, but I'd have to say, too, uh, in my work in development, it's something I didn't quite understand, which is I've been an academic all my life. Academics tend to know only other academics. Uh, to get out into the world and meet all the interesting people who've done all these interesting things, for me, I've considered it a great, ple a great pleasure, a great enhancement of my life. And in some cases, it's very explicit. People who came to Duke on financial aid and say, I want my money to go for scholarships because I want to make it possible for other people to go. Or the people who simply say, I recognize now, in ways I didn't when I was a student, the profound influence that Duke had in shaping my life. And I want to say thank you. And I'm now able to do that financially or with my time as a volunteer or both. And that's a, a very heartening thing to hear. People, people talk a lot nowadays about measuring outcomes in education as if like you could administer some test or scan of the person on the day of graduation and see what good they got out of it. But the good of a college education is like a, a, a picture negative that develops over the whole of your life. And I, I am always encountering what Nan said too, which is of people who uh, come to understand what this meant to you and what, what it meant to your life uh, and who want to give back. And that's, it's a wonderful thing. It's, a, it's a, one of the really lovely things about campaign, the way people who got a benefit want to reinvest for the benefit of people of the next generation and the next generation. Once again, welcome to Dean Richard Broadhead, Dick Broadhead. Thank you very much. Nan Cohan, you haven't gone yet. No way. And we know you'll stay close when you are gone. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Great pleasure. Great pleasure.